So it's very, very good to be here. And I, uh, I know we only go for a, an hour. I've argued that seminars should only be like 12 minutes to force speakers to get to their point. And on some level, I'm going to fly at 34,000 feet. So if you start asking questions about standard errors and things, I am uh, uh, going to defer that to, to private discussion. I've reached a certain age where I just think big thoughts. <laughs> and folks, this is going to be a talk about the bus. I'm going to crack a lot of jokes. Not everyone thinks I'm funny, but I find that funny. And so, uh, and we'll come back to that. Folks, I've done a lot of work recently on China, and we're going to be indirectly talking about China today. But I am an environmental and urban economist. I think it's a very interesting field. And there's more and more folks working in this field. For folks who really want to see what I do, read my recent paper with Sichi in the Journal of Economic Literature. University of Chicago Press will publish our book uh, later this year, Blue Skies in Urban China. I want to spend two minutes on the big ideas of the book so you don't have to buy it. And I, a, in a nutshell, here's what we do. Folks, a college station, uh, so, so does it get smoggy in the summer? I, so I, I, we'll see if I'm ever invited back. But I, the college station looks like a livable place to me. In contrast, China has many cities that, due to industrial production and coal burning, are very highly polluted. Has anyone seen any of the New York Times' pieces about challenges to quality of life in China? Where the theme that the New York Times authors, like, uh, I won't name them, Keith Bradisher and Wang, the, the themes these guys are trying to bring out is, yes, China's growing by 8% per year. Can folks hear me in back? Yes, China's growing by 8% per year, but because its pollution externalities are rising with the scale of coal use and with industry, quality of life in China is not growing by 8% per year. Folks, one of the arguments Sichi and I argue is that the Chinese urban, increasingly educated households are well aware that, that there are not blue skies in China. They've been to the United States. They're well aware that their children suffer as a byproduct of pollution exposure, that the productivity of the Chinese people suffers due to exposure to pollution. Folks, I'm not a fatalistic person. The first step to solving a quality of life issue is to recognize the issue. Don't feel sorry for the Chinese people. On some level, they created this situation. When I present my work in China, people say, we were highly polluted because you US consumers at your Walmart wanted all this stuff. And those are interesting questions about supply and demand. But the point of our work is that the Chinese people increasingly demand blue skies. And even though China is not a democracy, when the urban middle class want improvements in quality of life, that creates an incentive for an autocracy that may not have a firm grasp on power. One way to keep power is to please the urban middle class. Have you noticed that there have been revolutions in other countries? One way to reduce the probability of such unrest is to have happy people. One way to have happy people is to deliver tangible public goods, blue skies and less food risk. And so we are writing down a supply and demand models of how you solve, how you achieve the win-win of urban growth and blue skies. Something Los Angeles now has, something New York City has. China's cities are going to make a transition from being industrial shops to making Amazon and Facebook, becoming ideas economies, human capital economies like a San Francisco. We talk on in our work about uh, this transition that is now, that we predict, is going to take place in China's leading cities. And so that's a talk for another day. Uh, but I encourage you to read that. That was a preview. Folks, buses, and I'm going to come back to China in a couple minutes, and you guys can now go. That was a joke. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about buses. How many of you come to College Station by public bus? I rest my case. The uh, cars and buses are substitutes. There's an interesting question, which Ed Glazer and I have worked on, of who rides the bus. Folks, why do poorer people tend to ride the bus? Buses are cheap out of pocket and slow. Private cars are expensive out of pocket and fast. In a value of time economy, where time is our scarcest asset, a standard comparative advantage argument predicts that richer people drive. But the bus, 
The public bus system continues to be the major way for getting people around. Los Angeles has a subway system, but nobody uses it. Have any of you ridden the subway in Los Angeles? It's interesting. I'd want to know why. <laughs> we, um, they used to not even collect tolls. Uh, and so buses are a key way for providing transportation services for urban people. Folks, in London, there's a much better set of buses. When I work at the National University of Singapore, Singapore has a great set of buses. People, middle, upper middle class people use public transit in nations like London and Singapore. That's interesting. If more people use public transit, there's several Pigouvian externalities that could be mitigated. Because of economies of scale, have you noticed that many people ride a bus? Because of economies of scale to a bus, there'd be lower greenhouse gas emissions, there, and there would be lower local air pollution. I want to focus a little bit of attention on this. And for folks looking for a research topic, this claim interests me very much. Folks, we know, have you noticed that there's traffic congestion in America's cities? Have you noticed that we don't do road pricing, even though one of the first things we teach in Econ 101 is to price scarce resources? Have you noticed your professor talking about the tragedy of the commons? Political economy is a growing field in economics right now. Daron Asimoglio and many other economists are in deep thought about political economy. If economists say that we need road pricing to solve traffic congestion, why have the American people rejected road pricing even though it's been successful in London and Singapore? One explanation is because they know if we had road pricing, this would help to mitigate urban traffic problems. But because many middle class people recognize that the opportunity cost of driving is to take a bus. If buses are of low quality, let me say it in a positive way. If bus service was of higher quality, more people would support road pricing. I'd ask you to think about that. That's going to be one of the motivations for today's talk. Folks, buses are big business, even though none of you are riding them. Did you know that there's 70,000 public transit buses? So let's hear a yes or a no. That you, you guys are now boring me. Did you care? No. They travel 21 billion miles. Folks, this is a slide that buses are big. There's never been a paper about public buses before in the last 30 years. And so I need to jump up and down that I'm important. <laughs> this, this is big money. And folks, we're about to get into a whole, I'm going to tell you a, a zillion funny facts. This is billion dollar stuff. It's small relative to private cars, but it's still billion dollar stuff. This is a long lived durable that costs billions to buy and it creates American jobs. I'm going to be talking about American jobs. I'm going to be talking about government deficits. I'm going to be talking about liberals. I'm going to be talking about unions. These are going to be Texas topics. And I'm far from Jerry Brown in Berkeley. So I can speak my mind to my people. This is, we're spending a lot of public, the public monopolist, let me be serious for a second because I'm running out of time. The public monopolist, public transit agencies have a monopoly on public transit. There isn't going to be perfect competition. They're going to be spending billions of US tax dollars paid by suburban drivers through gas taxes. And we're going to be purchasing buses and we're going to be paying mechanics to maintain these buses. And folks, Many interesting things are about to happen. So I have the time of my life talking about this paper. My co-authors want me to calm down. We've got some boring econometric questions, each of which I will jazz up. What are the determinants? So let's set this up. Suppose this was Dallas, and suppose you ran the Dallas Public Transit Agency. And I, I apologize, I've not done enough regional reading about Houston or Dallas. If you ran the, the Dallas Transportation Agency, you are going to face a demand for public transit service. It is your job as the boss to supply those services. How many buses are you going to hire? Of what vintage? When do you scrap your buses? If you purchase new buses, who do you purchase them from? Folks, can we all agree that these are managerial questions? These are the types of things we're about to be talking about in gruesome detail. What are the determinants of when bus agencies scrap their existing set of buses? So does anyone own a 1995 Toyota? When do you scrap that thing as a private consumer? If you own a bus, when do you scrap that bus? Who do but urban transit agencies buy buses from? Folks, is the answer going to be Korea, China, or Japan? No, no foreign buses. It's going to be interesting. What determines the type of bus agents? What? What determines the type of bus the agencies choose to buy? 
this is going to be more interesting than it sounds. Folks, the reason I got excited about this project as a University of Chicago economist is I'm very interested in the efficiency of local governments. And we're going to have some results on the private sector versus the public sector, some revealed preference tests of, of how local government entities make multi-billion dollar decisions. I think that's mildly interesting. Yes? So we've been thinking about whether government agencies are deciding whether to run their own buses or to have a private company run buses. So this is an excellent question and a weakness of the current draft. Several of the cities in our sample, including Phoenix and New Orleans, privatized their system within our study period. We're thinking of writing a second paper where to reanalyze some of the inefficiencies I'm going to document and to see if they vanish when the agency goes private. Her question is outstanding. We're not there yet. We've had conversations as a group to do that. That's on our to-do list. We're, let, make sure, hold my feet to the fire on that. The short answer is we do not have a selection equation of who privatizes versus who stays public. Folks, we've already done this slide that there are, in a Pigouvian sense, there would be social benefits to a society if all of us took the bus. We'd be more likely to take the bus if the bus were of higher quality. Uh, the famous Harvard economist Meyer Keenan Wall argued that if there were dedicated bus lanes that, that where buses infrequently stopped, more people would take the bus. There'd be private time savings. Buses are cheap but slow. Our time is our scarce asset that the economies of scale of the bus would help to reduce pollution and local traffic problems. I'm taking that as a given to motivate this project. People make their decisions based on private cost benefits. Public policymakers care about social benefits and social costs of decisions. We've already done this, but let's do this one more time and let's celebrate the Texas Transportation Institute. There's three major challenges to urban quality of life urban air pollution, urban crime, traffic congestion. We've made great progress on urban air pollution and on urban crime. We have made very little progress, as TTI has documented, on traffic congestion. Again, if road pricing would be more politically sellable if public transit were of higher quality. And I think much more work needs to be done on this. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pose an empirical puzzle about the U.S. bus fleet. And there's an interesting question. If you did our study in other nations, would you find similar results? I'd love to start a literature. That's what I do. Uh, we're then going to talk about the decision problem of a public transit agency and how complex it is, the obje its objectives and its constraints. I'm going to talk about the revealed preference of bureaucracy. We're then going to present our empirical analysis of what these bus fleets do, measured in terms of bus fleet turnover, capital investment, and upgrading of their fleet. And then I'm going to run out of here. Here's the motivation of the whole paper. Folks, for private vehicles, and my co-author Shan is one of the world's leading experts on this, when the price of gasoline goes up, does your demand for a Hummer change? It's been documented in many cases that the demand for fuel-efficient vehicles like the Toyota Prius goes way up when the price of gasoline goes up. This is not rocket science. The private vehicle fleet, private individual decision makers, are much more likely to purchase a green fuel-efficient vehicle when the price of gas is high. I'm about to show you in the next slide some simple econometrics that the public bus fleet has a zero elasticity. And so, let me show you the fact, and I don't want to be worked over too much, Dr. Pulley. The dependent variable here, the unit of analysis here is a city year, is a transit agency year. It might be Santa Monica in the year 1997. It might be Chicago in the year 2008. The dependent variable, folks, suppose that Chicago had 100 buses in the year 1998. Do you agree we could calculate the gallons per mile, the inverse of miles per gallon? We have data on total gallons of gasoline consumed for each transit agency in each year. Can everyone visualize that as the numerator? We know the total miles traveled of this fleet. That's the denominator. Take the numerator, total gallons of gas, divide by the denominator, total miles traveled, and that's GPM, gallons per mile of gasoline consumed. We regress that in a city year-level regression on the unemployment rate in the city, all these explanatory variables here, 
and I don't mean to blind anyone, but what I want you to take away is the top row. No matter how we do this, you get a zero elasticity. When the price of gasoline goes up, I want to tell you two facts. I want to make a stock point and a flow point. For the existing stock of vehicles the bus agency owns, fuel economy does not rise when gas prices are higher, and the new vehicles they purchase are not more fuel efficient. Did everyone hear me? In contrast with the private vehicle fleet, when gas prices are higher, you have statistically significant and negative, and, and these are larger than they look. Uh, you get negative and statistically significant results that when gas prices are higher, the private vehicle fleet becomes more fuel efficient. In contrast, again, we've got a bunch of zeros for bus fleet fuel economy. And this is the motivating fact for our paper. So, so folks, let me come to a complete stop because you have the right to have a, a useful hour for you. Is my fact clear? Uh, and does anyone have any questions here? Because the rest of this talk will be even more worthless un unless... Yes, sir. What are the observ what's the number of observations in this? There's 2,500 observations here. This is in the paper. This is uh, table two or something. But, but it, the rest of the paper will not be interesting. This is our motivating fact, and so I, I need to spend, we need to have a pregnant pause of boredom for everyone to digest the genius of this. And, I, and this, this is a suggestive piece of evidence. And folks, so why is it interesting to show that the public fleet doesn't respond to energy prices? That suggests sluggishness if this is a causal relationship. This suggests sluggishness. And folks, have any of you ever been interested in cost minimization? This suggests that they're not solving a cost minimization problem. And that interests an economist when you see waste like that. I was going to say, local governments usually don't want to make the investment in these bus fleets since they once a decade or once every 20 years. They're not going to buy a new bus fleet every time a new model comes out. So we're going to be talking about this. But, but then we get into the question of why. What's the difference between a household and a public transit agency? And so, so we need to talk all of this through. But I, but I agree with you. Steve? So I don't think this is nitpicky. Let's just imagine consumers are kind of naive about what they think gasoline prices are going to be over the course of however many years you own a car but maybe bus fleet owners are a little smart. So if you were to put like futures prices of- Very nice. So I thought you were gonna do it backwards. I thought you were gonna call the public sector behavioral and the private sector rational expectations. Steve- I don't, don't believe that's true, but I'm just- You still get, you keep your Chicago undergraduate degree. The, <laughs> we as a group have been fighting each other over expectations formation. Are we myopic guys? Are we rational expectations guys? Are we perfect foresight guys? No matter what Shan, codes up, we get this. And in the final version of the paper, we need to have a cleaner set of columns related to expectations. But you put your finger on a fight the group has had. What do we know about the, the life of a bus, though? It lives the same age as a car at age 15. Seriously, I figured those diesel engines would just go forever. I'm going to, we have a scrappage graph in our first table. I think I'll have a picture to show you. Uh, but, but, but you guys are on to me. This is durable capital. When do you scrap your capital? And so for the economists in the room, start thinking about John Russ's optimal uh, obsolescence problem. Uh, and, and we will get there in our own crazed way. Folks, when OPEC kicked in in the 1970s and oil prices rose, my father substituted from a Buick LeSabre to a Toyota and never bought another American car again. You can boo him. In, I guess you don't care. The, <laughs> I'm grading you. The, in the case of buses though, one possible explanation for the zero is this fact. There's not a single Asian bus in the fleet. And Asian nations make fuel efficient vehicles as I'm about to show you. We're, we're gonna have an interesting violation of the law of one price. There's a question, is a bus a bus? And I'll come back to that. Forget China for the moment. Tokyo and Seoul, Japan and South Korea make buses half the price of the US, which have much higher fuel economy. But even when gas prices are high in the US, domestic buyers don't buy them, unlike private consumers who substituted to Toyota. Folks, can we say interesting? You can still walk out the door. Yes? What's the time span that you're looking for? We're going to be looking from 1997 till now. So we're talking about 
uh, some cities that never had to buy buses? No, if you look at our data, they're always buying. In growing cities, y y if you have more poor people, you're going to have to meet that demand. In a shrinking city, and my co-authors in a Detroit, as Detroit shrinks, if Detroit has big budget deficits, they could just keep their existing durables longer. Have any of you ever deferred maintenance? I taught at Columbia University, whose middle name was deferred maintenance, uh, to pay Jeff Sachs' salary. You turn that off. The, um, these are growing, we have many growing cities in the U.S., like Las Vegas, who don't, they got to buy new buses to meet this demand. So give me a couple minutes to get to your point. But if, I, if we looked at the raw data together, there's not that many zeros. They're always buying buses. And the buses they're buying are never fuel efficient buses. I didn't say that. I'm also a professor at a law school. We're looking at averages and looking at a regression. Let me show you my results. There's always outliers. But there's a quote from a regression. A regr Let me show you my regressions and then we can come back to what we're talking, but I did not say what you just said. What happens Folks, to the electric buses? I'm going to show you those as well. And they're going to be bought in Berkeley and in some liberal cities. And so, folks, uh, Joanna, how late do we go? Uh, so you let me hit the gas, and now, now let me defer a couple of questions. You guys got to let me show you my cards. So pretend this doesn't interest you. So as we talk about in the paper, the United States is making vehicles that get about three and a half miles per gallon. Tokyo is making diesel buses. Folks, there's going to be interesting bundling issues. Diesel kicks up particulate matter, and that may be part of the story as we're going to show you. South Korea makes buses that get, you can do your ratios here of much more fuel efficient vehicles. Shanghai buses have this fuel economy. To the far right, you get the prices in the same units, and you can, you can see very, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Folks, there's supposed to be a law of one price in markets. These are durable goods that can be shipped across markets. There's a question, is a bus a bus? And I'm going to come back to that. But folks, take a look at the violation of the law of one price. And it's going to, I'm going to give an explanation for that. But I'm holding off questions for 10 minutes. And then you, there can be a feeding frenzy. Is that okay, Joanne? Is that, now can I impose? It's okay. Thank you. Here's a bus. Here's a bus. I'm going to toggle back and forth. Bus, bus, bus. You'll, they they kind of look like each other. So there's always an issue with differentiated products. Is it an apples to apples comparison? Because a Chicago economist, Jesse Shapiro, said to me, Matt, they could have different unobservables. It could be the case that even if the United States could purchase these foreign buses, that they wouldn't. That these guys have, that American buses have better unobservables, and that explains this capitalization. We'll come back to that, and I respect that, but I, uh, let me show you my cards in my remaining 35 minutes. Folks, fact number one, 56% of America's buses are produced by Gilligan New Flyer. Have you ever heard of these companies? Well, you're a smart man. Folks, this is not Ford. Who are these people? Well, Ford is down here at 3%. Folks, is it interesting to the industrial organization economists in the room that no-name firms are producing America's buses? When can that occur in equilibrium? When there's protection. I could teach physics at Texas A&M if I have no competition, and I got a C in high school in it. Is anyone with me? It's, um, these no-name companies, read the far right column. This is a, 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 a cumulative distribution function. Read the far right. In the year 2011, these are the, frac these are the domestic sellers of these buses in the United States. 56%, 57% of U.S. buses are produced by these two no-names. How can that be an equilibrium in a world where there are companies like Hyundai uh, and, and other major Asian players who have a tremendous experience making these buses? It's interesting. We have slides in the paper. Oh, this, this documents what I just said, that there are companies like Mercedes who are producing 30 to 40,000 buses a year, major companies in China producing thousands of buses a year, and these Chinese companies are selling all over the world. So folks, there's something about the US as a closed market. So I want everyone to read this point and not look at my ugly face. There are international exporters in Asia selling to bus makers all around the world, but not to the US. It's interesting. Why? Folks, another interesting fact. Did you know that 47% of our buses are made in California and Minnesota, the manufacturing centers of the world? 
What interests Shan very much, Shan is an expert on cars. An industrial organization economist might have thought that we would produce buses where we produce cars. Folks, aren't buses and cars kind of alike? You want to see me pretend I'm a bus and a car? We don't. It's interesting. Why? If I can do my Gary Becker. I see I can't. I do it in the shower. So now let's begin on supply and demand so that I can let you guys back in in about 10 minutes. On the demand side of the market, urban transit, and we've spoken to many of these guys. I've made a whole bunch of friends in transit agencies. Let's talk about demand. We're stronger on demand than we are on supply, but we think we have a domestic protected industry that does not face competition, knows that it doesn't face competition. And folks, when you're a monopolist, do you have any incentive to innovate? And this is how you don't get any Teslas or Toyota Priuses. This is how you end up with a stagnant industry selling to a captured market. And that's how you get our zero, and that's the end of the paper. But now to back up. An urban transit agency, whether it's Las Vegas, Chicago, or Los Angeles, different cities have different per capita income levels. They have different population sizes. Different cities face the Clean Air Act regulation. For cities in high particulate matter, PM10, Houston has bad air quality. Folks, if under the Clean Air Act, you're assigned to non-attainment status, your county will face extra regulation that makes it difficult to purchase diesel buses. Diesel buses are fuel efficient, but dirty. If you are assigned to non-attainment status under the Clean Air Act, you will face constraints nudging the bus authority to purchase electric hybrid vehicles that are not very fuel efficient, but that are very clean. Folks, a key issue that has been raised with us many times is that the mechanics have human capital, firm-specific human capital. The mechanics have knowledge for specific buses. When your car breaks down, do you fix it yourself or do you bring it to a shop? Unlike the private buyer, public buses do everything in-house. Back to Ronald Coase's theory of the firm, make versus buy, public transit agencies do all their bus repair in-house. Is everyone with me? If your mechanics are trained in a certain type of bus that tr provides a lock-in effect, which I'm going to document, that you don't switch buses because you, your mechanics don't know how to fix some Korean bus. You've also accumulated a large number of inventory of parts for specific buses that you can't sell on eBay. So there's this lock-in effect, which we think is very interesting. Uh, we're going to study in a moment what you scrap, what you buy, and whether you purchase See uh, compressed natural gas, diesel, or hybrid electric vehicles. And that's what I'm going to do. So to begin to pick up speed, and I want to talk about the Buy America requirement that plays an absolutely crucial role in this paper. Every transit agency, whether it's Dallas or some other place, it forecasts aggregate demand for its services. It, that's demand. It then purchases the buses. So if there are 30 million riders, and if there's 30 people on a bus, you need to have a million bus trips. You have to have buy that number of buses multiplied by trips so that aggregate supply matches aggregate demand. We've mentioned this. Folks, I now want to talk about the Buy America requirements. And I, we think that this is fundamentally important here. The federal government provides up to 80% of the subsidy to, uh, to purchase new buses. But there are strings attached. If you want this federal money, you face the Buy America mandate. I want to show you this slide. This is a slide of fixed effects where for each city year, we, count, we, we have data on how much money the transit agency received from the federal government. Folks, do you see a Democrat effect? Uh, so especially in 2008, but I, I guess I don't have a laser pointer. Do you see, uh, do you see, I'm gonna do this wrong. It, we, we get a, a Clinton jump and then we get an Obama jump. Uh, and so under, in certain years when Democrats are in power, urban cities are getting a lot of money for, for, from, the, from the government uh, for public transit investment. It's interesting. And again, all of this is in the paper. If folks think that I'm skipping details, speaking fast, please read the paper. So we think that there's a political piece to this of what could, urban riders tend to be in democratic districts in center cities. 
And we're seeing major investments uh, during times when Democrats are in charge, a major jump. And of course, the recession of 2008 is what I want to talk about. Folks, I want to make a point for those who remember Dwight D. Eisenhower about the military industrial complex. Here is the president of Gillig. The president of Gillig, Gillig is one of the major bus providers. A typical year industry-wide, agencies buy about 5,000 buses a year. With the fiscal stimulus of 2009, it's up to 7,000 for this year. But if the stimulus hadn't come through in the recession, there would have been demand for 3,000 buses. Folks, do you see a Keynesian push here? It's interesting. None of these papers about the stimulus have talked about what capital was actually purchased with the money we used in the recent stimulus. And so it's interesting to talk about how the public sector's capital stock has been impacted. And folks, jobs, 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 American jobs. Do I need to say that again? A very reasonable question from a public finance expert is, Matt, what determines how much money Las Vegas gets in the year 2003? We talk in the paper, there's certain exogenous aspects and certain endogenous aspects. There's certain discretionary pieces of the funding. Uh, we continue to debate as co-authors. The amount of funding a transit agency receives from the federal government is going to be one of our explanatory variables. There's reasons to believe it's exogenous. A tough guy could say that it's endogenous. And so a Keep this in mind, and I'm happy to come back to this in the questions, but it's important to first establish what our facts are. But in the paper, we discuss the federal funding formulas. We're going to take this as an exogenous variable, that, and here's what we're going to find. When cities get a larger transfer from the federal government, they're going to be more likely to scrap their existing buses and more likely to buy expensive hybrid electric buses. That's going to be one of the findings that's coming. And now let me tell you about the Buy America Act. Folks, I, Senator Davis introduced this in 1933. The adoption of this amendment will mean work for our workers. It will help stem the tide of foreign competition and thus prevent further reduction of wages for the American worker. Federal, if Dallas Transit Authority takes federal money, they face the Buy America mandate. The Buy America Act applies to all U.S. federal government agencies. Under the Act, all public use items. So, folks, this is why it's so important that public transit is provided publicly. All public use goods must be produced in the United States. So, folks, this puts the Asian companies at a disadvantage. Yes, they can locate a subsidiary here, but then they'd have to pay American wages. So, is everyone with me here? This is the shield. The U.S. government's Buy America procurement standards demand that at least 60% of each bus be made in the U.S. And folks, here's a bus. Hey! What we're trying to convey here is that a bus is a complex supply chain with many parts benefiting many states. So here, I know it's hard to read. This is an appendix in our paper. This is the engine propulsion technology, and you're supposed to see that it's produced in California, Indiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, New York, North Carolina. And, and so this is a complex supply chain of, of, of who is gaining. Uh, yes, it's assembled in California and Minnesota, but these, these parts that are finally assembled are produced in a large number of places. And this was from the annual report of one of the domestic suppliers. Folks, notice that they titled it, Bus Manufacturing Equals Jobs Across America. So we already made this point so for those of you interested in political economy, what we think is going on is this. U.S. taxpayers, suburbanites who don't ride buses, are paying higher taxes. Foreign potential exporters are losing sales so that center city residents, and those two groups lose from the set of rules we've discussed. The winners are domestic bus riders, I mean, really domestic these guys. I misspoke. The people who assemble these parts for these buses face less international competition because this is a public sector taking public funds and with the Buy America shield. And folks, what I find interesting is if you type into EconLit Buy America, there have basically been no papers on this. Uh, and so I'd be grateful to you if you could point out recent papers published in the last 20 years quantitative papers using the word Buy America. So at a time when we have a recession, when we have a government budget deficit, 
when urbanites need higher quality services and we want less road congestion, we've come up with a set of rules that limit the gains to trade between us and China. It's interesting. There's winners from that, but there's also losers. Our model, we write down a, a dynamic programming model, and it has five comparative statics that I want to walk you through. Federal funding accelerates the scrappage of existing buses and encourages new buses. As buses age, maintenance costs increase, which accelerates scrappage. Higher fuel prices accelerate fleet renewal if we didn't have the Buy America mandate. Folks, a question that we're grappling with is this. Why don't the domestic sellers of buses make fuel-efficient buses? And our explanation for that is the, the lock-in effect that I'm going to show you that if you came out with a fuel-efficient vehicle, it would cost you money to design that. And it's not clear to us who would demand it, given that many bus agencies have locked in. There's less incentive to innovate if there isn't a market share to capture. I've made these points. I'm going to show you a series of reduced form regressions and uh, related to the decision to scrap, related to the decision by a transit agency of how many buses to purchase, and related to what type of bus you buy. And I'd love to finish this in 10 minutes to then open this up to questions. We're unable to implement John Russ's Econometrica research design because we don't, and we can't imitate BLP because we don't know the price that different transit agencies would have been charged for vehicles they didn't buy. Uh, I can come back to that, but it, a, there's a question of how you recreate the choice set and budget constraint for these cities. And we, what we're going to observe is we're going to observe the total expenditure on new buses by each transit agency, and we're going to be able to calculate the average price by bus by year by bus maker. <laughs> Our data is from the National Transit Database, the NTD. As I said, it's from 1997 to 2011. And it provides detailed information on the inventory of buses each transit agency has, its budget expenditure on what it's spending money on, its, the, its expenditure it's receiving from the federal and state local government, its energy consumption measured in uh, the value of this fuel, and measured in physical quantity units of how much energy it's consuming and the mileage of each of its buses. The first regression I'm going to show you is going to be of the following form. The dependent variable, so suppose that Chicago had 100 buses made by Gillig in the year 1998, and it gets rid of 12 of them. It's RJCT would equal 12%, that it got rid of 12 of its 100 buses. We're going to run this model of <coughs> scrapping buses as a function of the bus's age, the, the amount of miles on the average bus, whether the county is in non-attainment NA with the Clean Air Act standard, whether how much federal transfers fed has been transferred to the local municipality, and a bunch of fixed effects. And here's what pops out. Oh, so I was asked a couple of questions before about bus scrappage. Folks, notice that no buses are scrapped until the bus turns age 10. And notice the very sharp increase in scrappage of buses from age 10 to 15. That's where the bulk of the scrappage occurs. And this shows you the total fleet and the total mileage. This is all in the paper. It's really between the ages of 10 and 15 where where a lot of buses are at risk to being scrapped. The bus agencies face a decision, do we scrap them? And if we do, do we replace them? And what do we replace them with? Here's what we find. Folks, in these regressions, starred coefficients are statistically significant. And we've had fights as co-authors. Uh, because scrappage is a truncated variable, we're running some Tobit models. Let me focus attention on column two. All else equal, if your county is not in attainment with the Clean Air Act, you're more likely to scrap your old buses. So one way to come in compliance, new buses are cleaner than old buses in terms of local air pollution. One way to come into compliance with regulation is to scrap your old buses. You're more likely, that coefficient of 0 0.1303, you're more likely to, do, to scrap old buses if your county is in non-attainment. Folks, the second row. 
you're more likely to scrap old buses if you've received more federal funding. And so that's a flavor of the revealed preference of what we're up to. This income result is a surprise. You should be more likely to scrap uh, buses uh, if they were old. So we need to interact this with old. It should be the case that you're more likely to scrap old buses if your county is richer. Uh, that's actually a puzzle that we need to do a better job on. I just repeated these points a moment ago. Fuel prices are uncorrelated with the scrappage decision. Yes, Nick. Questions? Okay, now, so um, the federal funding, how does it work in the sense of kind of an annual take it or leave it, and if you pass on federal funding, there's no... Kind of so I'd have you read our paper. You get it, and you can sit on it for three years. And so we, and so again, you want me to lawyer up. Read it again. And so we... We are trying to get a cleaner discussion of this. We don't think this is an identity. We, we don't, so we don't think the causality goes, you bought a bus, you then apply for funding uh, to recover the receipts you just ran up. And there is a lot, a, this money, the real identification in our model is coming from these time series. So th there is, th there's cross-sectional variation, but the t take a look at, th these are fixed effects off a of log regression. There are, there's a large time series dimension. So Steve, I'd have you reread this slide. The, 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 the Obama stimulus gives us quite a natural experiment. And that's really where our identification is coming from. I agree with you, uh, and we are fighting as a research team how to clean this up. And I can talk offline about instrumental variable strategies that we're thinking about. Uh, other questions on the scrappage model? Is there a market for used buses? So I've done work on the market for used cars. We've sent 2.5 million cars under NAFTA to Mexico. Did you read my paper that went, as the US sent our used cars to Mexico, it reduced air pollution in both nations? We sent them cars dirtier than our average car, but which were cleaner than their average car. Just looking for a laugh. So read Davis and Kahn, 2010 American Economic Journal. For used buses, I've Googled it a zillion times. There's not a domestic market. Some of these buses must be going to the Philippines, but it takes money to ship these things. And so an arbitrager would face an issue. If the thing has scrappage value of $4,000 and it costs 5,000 to ship, that's not a great play. That's interesting because cities have traded rail cars, light rail cars between cities, so it's interesting there's no data on buses. So I agree with you, and I've searched many times. I'd be grateful if anyone had a tip on that. I've searched many times for, for trade and used durables. I think there's more papers to be written on air conditioners, fans, computers. I, I, so Lucas Davis and I wrote the paper for cars, and it, it, the paper's generating sites, but there's not that many people interested in, in one man's garbage is another man's export opportunity. And that's, um, yes. So this is kind of a more global question, but it's not obviously why uh, scrappage should respond, in particular if the cars are investing in substitutes, and gas prices go up, some people are thinking about it. So that is correct. So she is correct that when gas prices go up, when gas prices go up, bus ridership rises. There's two ways to meet that. You could reduce scrappage or you could buy new buses. And so you're right about how does demand, how does supply meet demand. And so we, we need to do a better job on your point, but you're right. So in terms of our current results, when fuel prices rise, more people will be riding, and you're right, that's, that should actually reduce uh, the propensity to scrap, and we find no effect. And we could do a better job on that. Thank you. Well, would that depend on the capacity of the bus rides? They're all, so, so I forgot to tell you this because there's so many things I wanted to tell you. The bus agencies are under requirement to be at 120%. They for, as I told you, they forecast aggregate demand for ridership. We lost it. They forecast aggregate demand for ridership and they have to have supply to meet 120% of that. They have to be 20% above that because buses are always falling apart, needing maintenance. And so you're telling a story of unexpected shocks, but that's too fancy. Uh, it's, um, so th they are ready for supply and demand to meet. Uh, let me show you two more things and we're done. The second set of equations we ask is, and this may interest you more than the scrappage equation, 
For those of you who are structural economists, who gets the market share? When gas prices go up, Toyota's market share goes up. We're now going to take a look in a sort of conditional logit framework. It's a regression, but we can set this up as a conditional logit. What we're going to take a look at which the dependent variable now is the share of new buses purchased by a given city in a given year. Folks, we're going to be interested. Let me show you the results and see what you guys think. Local dummy is a dummy variable that equals one if the producer of the bus is headquartered in the, in the bus agency state. Local is a dummy variable that equals one. So if the, if the unit of analysis was Los Angeles in the year 2003, the local dummy would equal one if the, if, if the bus seller in question is in California. So this is like a marriage market. Which domestic buyers are matching with which sellers? Folks, do you see the positive statistically significant coefficients in columns two through four? All else equal, bus buyers are more likely to purchase from those bus sellers who are headquartered in their state. You are more likely to purchase a domestic bus if you're in a pro-union state. This is the lock-in effect result. If the bus, if Los Angeles has purchased buses from that seller in the past, Los Angeles is more likely to purchase from that same seller now. This might be relationship specific match. This might be the parts and inventory and human capital. This is the lock in effect result. So again, if all else equal, the bus buyers, the bus public transit agencies are more likely to buy from those domestic for-profit sellers who they've purchased from before. We are having a debate in the paper, we interpret this lock-in effect as duration dependence. And of course, you can face the challenge of, if you see me purchase from a pre, from repeatedly from the same seller, is that because I've learned to love their product or that their product has certain unobservables that I'm well matched with? And that's a classic issue in econometrics, which our work has some ideas for how to solve. Folks, the final thing, and this comes back to a question I was asked in the back row, is the choice of bus. There are three types of bus technology. There's old fashioned diesel buses, there's compressed natural gas, and there's hybrids. Let me, in product differentiated space, let me tell you about these buses. Diesel is cheap, relatively fuel efficient, and dirty in terms of particulate matter. Hybrids are expensive and have low fuel economy, and CNG is sort of in the middle. Uh, maybe I should have just shown you these facts. Uh, hybrid buses are much more expensive than diesel buses, and hybrid buses have much lower... Oh, sorry, I just misspoke a moment ago. CNG buses are less fuel efficient than diesel buses, but they have lower particulate matter emissions. Hybrid buses are both more expensive and are better on those two environmental attributes. This slide is to show you that the U.S. bus fleet is changing. Uh, in the year 1997, 88% of the fleet were diesel. These things don't add up to 100%. In the year 2011, it had shrunk to 63%. The bus fleet is changing. The, right, the left column show you the stock. The right column show you the characteristics of the buses sold recently, showing you that hybrid, uh, hybrid share is rising and diesel share is falling. Here's what we do. This is the final set of regressions I want to show you. We find all else equal. If, you, if the bus is a diesel bus and the county is non-attainment, these agencies are less likely to purchase those buses. That's the top row. They're more likely to buy the bus if the county is not in compliance with the Clean Air Act and the bus is a CNG bus. Uh, to our surprise, find no result for what if it's a hybrid bus and you're out of so if you're out of attainment with the Clean Air Act you purchase a CNG bus not a diesel bus and that has implication notice that these buses are less fuel efficient than the diesel this could be one partial explanation for our zero price elasticity for fuel economy which again this evidence is supposed to speak to the other result, when your state is richer, you're more likely to purchase a hybrid bus. And when you receive more federal funding, you're more likely to purchase a hybrid bus. And folks, in results we need to add, liberal cities are more likely to purchase hybrid buses, whether it's Portland, Seattle, 
Berkeley. And so I've done a lot of work on how liberals vote their pocketbook. And this is consistent with that, that all else equal, liberal cities uh, purchasing the greenest technology. Again, the hybrid buses are more expensive, but are cleaner on both of these attributes. So this is my conclusion, I'll stop. Due to the Buy America restriction, domestic bus suppliers are not facing foreign competition, not facing foreign competition, and knowing that domestic buyers have locked in with the mechanics and the human capital, domestic suppliers have less of an incentive to pay fixed costs to innovate. And thus, they're less responsive to gas prices. When gas prices rise for the private sector, Toyota comes out with greener vehicles and people buy them. People are at the margin. And folks, that's it. Let me open this up to questions. I can do those slides if folks have no questions, but I want to be fair to you. Yes. So are all the fleets uh, single um, uh, company fleets? or? So, so the market shares we're seeing, and we've been going back and forth on this, are at 50 to 60%. And so, so it's not one. So to say that again, for a Las Vegas, they are purchasing 60% of their buses from, from, from one seller. And so I went back and forth if that's a small or large number. I was hoping it would be one. The log beam fact to talk about what's the transition probability. The, the number you mentioned there is a probability, transition probability. So I had I purchased and what's the probability buy again, same brand. Yes. That's the transition probability. You reported it. We haven't set it up. That's, that is our thought experiment. We have not reported that in the text. Okay. We, we have thought that that's the right way to separate out duration dependence versus heterogeneity, to do it make by make. So, so this effect is averaged over that lock-in effect I showed you. This is averaged over all the sellers. We were thinking we need to break this out for each of the sellers to see if this coefficient is the same. But, but this is, we haven't interacted this with the seven major sellers. And what's the, how much of the difficulty Domestic, you know, different manufacturers, but both domestic brand versus foreign brand. There's some estimate about the maintenance, you know, specialties, those kind of things. None of the transit agency people I've spoken to, I didn't ask that question. I, I don't know the, the answer to that specificity. These guys stressed it, it, it was the, it was an Oliver Williamson, the set of parts they have. So even if the guy knew how to work the bus, he didn't have the parts, the parts differ bus to bus. So there's human capital and there's the parts and, and of economies of scale if you lock in with one seller. I'm interested in, um, I know in diesel trucks, for example, the, the new diesel trucks are a lot uh, less fuel efficient than, than the old ones. Is, and, and, and it's largely, I'm told, because of the pollution equipment that they've had to install on. Is that also true for the for these diesel buses? And if so, uh, what is, could it be that these old buses, you, you want to keep them around because they're much more fuel efficient than the new ones? So you just put your finger on, my first book was called Green Cities, Urban Growth and the Environment. If Los Angeles has falling ozone, but rising greenhouse gas emissions, is it a green city? The answer to that depends on how you prioritize local air quality versus climate change. What Jim just sketched is the following. So let me answer his question, but, but then generalize it. If we care more about fuel economy, then you would wanna keep old diesel buses around. But if you worry about local air pollution, then you want these buses out. And so we can't have it all. Uh, environmentalists, including myself, we have to be clear about our priorities. And so if your priorities are local air, so one way to explain our paper's core puzzle, and maybe that's what Jim was trying to get me to do, is our core puzzle was when gas prices go up, buses don't become more fuel efficient. One story is that many counties do face, and we can quantify this better, these Clean Air Act standards, and that nudges them to, to fight PM10 it, it, the, here's the way I should say it. The win-win for the environmentalists would be if we just did hybrid buses. 
They, they would be fuel efficient and they would have 90% lower PM, but they're really expensive. The, the poor man's way of solving the PM10 problem is to substitute from here to here, but then, but we only get a slight improvement in miles per gallon. And I, we have not quantified your point about changes in the fuel economy of diesel buses. We can, I don't know the answer to your point of whether new diesel buses are less fuel efficient than old ones because of Clean Air Act catalytic converters. It's interesting. Yes. When they're talking about the cleanliness, the cleanliness of the vehicles in contrast to diesel and the hybrid, are they accounting for the disposal of the batteries? The no. So life cycle analysis is a very important topic at my Institute of the Environment. So he just raised a crucial issue. When I was blathering about Los Angeles on local air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, I didn't mention does defunct durables end up in Mexico from if Kim Kardashian consumes these things. And life cycle analysis tries to incorporate a green product is one that is born green, lives green, and dies green. This analysis is not looking at the disposal of the product. Yes. And then how many times are they replacing the batteries in life cycle? So I know some engineers at UCLA who claim that they can recycle those batteries, but, but, but up till now, those things have been thrown in landfill. I mean, they've had an ugly death. They, and so, I mean, how does, that, how does that contribute to the cost of the hybrid? Are they, I mean, are they accounting for that cost? for the replacement of the batteries and that price that's up there? I want to say no, this was the purchase price. This was not a life cycle externality analysis. So this, these prices, I am almost sure, is these do not reflect, I do not believe they reflect a disposal cost capitalized in. But that's an interesting point that we don't discuss in the text. It's also saying maintenance costs. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the Honda uh, hybrid, the battery drives every three years since it's for design. So I like that. I would say that a forward-looking entity should anticipate that and be willing to bid less on this in equilibrium. So this is an equilibrium price that should reflect future attributes of quality. But, but I do like your point very much. Or to say that differently, if, if hybrid bus buyers knew that they faced a substantial landfill fee, this price would fall, I mean, uh, or demand would fall for these things as the externalities internalized. We had not thought of that point. Yes. How many miles per year does a bus? These, oh, so this is crucial. So that was the thing I cut off. It's going 67,000 miles a year. Folks, do, can I do my Leontiev and, and let everyone go in, in a minute? So a calculation we do in the paper is we have a, le a bus is a, bu a bus services is a bus, a driver, and a mechanic. We can actually write down a Leontiev production function. So you buy the bus for 300 grand, you rent a driver and a mechanic, the bus goes 67,000 miles, and you could get that if you drive at 12 miles an hour around the clock for 365 days. It gets three miles per gallon, so it consumes 22,000 gallons of gas. At three bucks a gallon, that's a large bill, but small relative to the labor bill. That's gonna be the key point that's coming. If you need 2.7 drivers driving 2,000 hours each to yield these total hours worked, the total hours is 15 times 365. And if you pay this guy 75 grand a year, 25 grand for the mechanic, the total labor bill for this bus is 230. You pay, assuming a 12 year life, you pay a rental fee for the bus of 32 grand. The bus fuel bill 70 grand. The average cost is 496 per vehicle mile traveled. This is at the end of the paper. We, for those who want to see my arithmetic, we then ask, if you purchased a Chinese bus but had to use U.S. labor, how much would average cost fall by? So we do the exact same calculation, but you now have the more fuel-efficient Chinese bus. This doesn't change, this changes, and this changes, and you end up with the average cost falling 18%. So when I posed our paper's puzzle to a leading guy at San Francisco, he said, Matt, you're right, but we pay our public union guys so much that energy is a small share. And so uh, another explanation for our puzzle is you drive your own cars. You don't pay yourself. This isn't Uber. You don't drive, you pay yourself to drive your car. The, when you add in the public union workers, the energy cost is just, yes, there's an energy savings from switching to the Chinese vehicle, but it's not enormous. And so we thought this was a fun example of linking factor prices to the cost structure of a firm because the production technology is so simple. Folks, thank you very much.